Hello, and I want to welcome you to another episode of the Shareholders Podcast. Thank you for investing in us. We appreciate it. I have a great show for you guys on today, and I'm really excited. Amazing guest. And I'm going to give you a little background very quickly. Um, I have to give a lot of thanks to Miss Chardé. And if you've been following us, she was probably maybe my third episode. And probably half the guests we've had on this show are influenced from her because of people that I saw at the Shades of Health Summit, which was just amazing. And she was she put all that together. And so I had to have her on. And I've had Jay on, of course. And um, there's going to be some more people coming on from that. But the gentleman to my left that I'm talking with today, he spoke at that conference and um, he was just amazing. And I, and as he was talking, I'm just in my head, I'm just like, yeah, I definitely got to try to get him on. Now, little did I know that this gentleman is actually Miss Sade Jenkins' father. And I didn't even know that, but we we talked, if you remember the episode with her, we kind of talked and she talked about her father and all that. Well, this is the gentleman here in the flesh, Mr. Rory Edwards. Sir, how are you doing? Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being on the Shareholders Podcast. And so we're going to get into it. If you... He's going to give us plugs later, but you'll be able to see some of, just some of the things that uh, this gentleman has been working on and working for the community and working abroad. Even so, I'm glad to get him here. He is maybe going to have to be in New Zealand, but we got him. <laughs> <laughs> so glad to have him here. So, sir, I just want to kind of give you even the background with this show. Is the shareholders is basically what we call uh, a program for entrepreneurs for people wanting to know more about business. And we're trying to share things okay. that we kind of consider have been held or hold, mm -hmm. holding from us in the community, some things that they don't want us to know or don't want us to be educated in. And that's the whole purpose of this show. And so we've had people come on of all walks of life. And everybody we kind of talk to, at some point I asked them about mentorship. But for you, among the many things you do, mentorship is a huge thing. You are a mentor to a lot of people in Chardé kind of broke that down and even how you've uh, been with her. So I want to ask you, first off, where is where does the passion come from in doing what you do for so many people? I think uh, <clears throat> one of the things that I remember, a lesson that I was taught when I was early, I mean young, when I was young and early in my life, somebody always told me that your job on earth is to give everything you were given to the next generation of people. Yeah. And if you don't do that, then you haven't fulfilled your purpose. Mm. And so um, one of the things that is so profound is that uh, in my teaching career, I taught uh, ancient history. Yeah. And one of the things in ancient history, it says that for you to move through the phase after you've gone on through to the afterworld is that your heart has to be lighter than an ostrich feather. Oh, wow. And so... So if we believe that, then I had to understand that concept. And so I had to apply that concept is that nothing that's given to me is for me to be to, for me to take with me mm -hmm. is to give all of that back. So all of the young people and old people and mature people and not so easy to work with people who have come across my life. I've tried to give them some type of gem or some type of seed that can help them move uh, you know, to their next phase in their journey. That's interesting. So then in your walk and in, and in your life, is that something that's always been in you or did you kind of have an awakening moment at some point? You know how when right. you're younger, it's kind of all about you and you're kind of trying to find your way. But is it always been in you or was it kind of something that happened? There? I think so. I think it's, uh, you know, and it's funny when I go back home, I wrote about this, too. You know, it says people always say uh, you think you better than everybody. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. And so I said, well, if I didn't think I was better than everybody and I would be normal. Yeah, yeah. Right. There we go. And so, you know, uh, Jay-Z says in one of his songs, um, say hello. He says, look around and see the, what ordinary gets you. Extraordinary figures. I'm an extraordinary. <laughs> right? Yeah. So I've always thought that I had to be better. Whatever I had to do, I always wanted to be the best at it. Mm -hmm. And if I didn't feel that I could be the best at it, I didn't do it. So I think that it's always been in me. I've always had the gift of gab. Mm -hmm. I haven't probably used it to the most beneficial uh, uh, standards that in some cases that I <laughs> should have used it, but I've refined it. And as I've grown and as I matured, uh, it's been something that I think has um, has also matured, you know, by the grace of God. Mm -hmm. So I think it's always been in me. It's always been in me. 
That's amazing to hear. And it and it really it comes genuine out of you. You know, there's just when I heard you talk, even at the summit, it was just so real and pure. And so I guess I, I kind of want to transition next to ask you then you work mm -hmm. in so many avenues, but a lot of times I've seen you I was on your website and kind of looking and and just seeing things that you do. And a lot of it, you work in the educational system with kids and right. young people especially. And so you're very much in tune with that. And of course you were working in a school, you work you know, as an educator right. as for a while as well. So you know firsthand. <clears throat> when I kind of look at the public schools now, and we've, had, you know, we've always been able to say that, man, these schools and this right. and that and That's that and right. that. And there's a lot that we all know that needs to be fixed. But if you could kind of in your journeys and in your in your lifetime, what is maybe one of the main things that you just really feel like is still not addressed enough in our formative educational uh, system? Uh, I think uh, the value of individuals. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there could be schools where education is supposed to be an entity that rises people above their current circumstances yeah. and taking them and elevating them to another level. And that was the purpose of education. Originally, there's so many debates about what the purpose of education was. Mm -hmm. uh, some people said at first when the Puritans came over here that their their mission to educate people was to be able to read the Bible. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it then became that we would set up education for people to be valuable and viable citizens so that the most educated society would be the most dominant society. Yeah. And so if you have smarter people, smarter people are able to move the bar a little bit higher. What has happened in uh, America is that we've stayed in the industrial face model of teaching. Children of this generation don't learn that way any longer. Right, yeah. And so the model is, is that you are trying to take a square peg and put it into a round hole and it's not working. Mm -hmm. So what you do is you get pushback from children because that's not the way they learn. Yeah. And so education is supposed to evolve just like life is supposed to evolve. And that's how you create. And so if there was one thing I would say, the evolution of education has not happened because it stayed stagnant and it stayed in an a industrial phase thinking model, which is not at all cohesive to moving uh, the bar forward. And it, and it goes to show in our national ranking. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, <laughs> we yeah. And there's a you know, there's that. I don't want to get political, but there's that <laughs> misnomer how America is the greatest country in the world and all that. But when you look right. at the numbers, especially for education, we are not, We're not. the greatest in education by far. Right. And uh, that's that's amazing you say that because I've had people just even on this show and we talk about there's times where you have to evolve with whatever it is that you're doing in Absolutely. terms of commerce and things. But in, as you say, in education, we seem to not have done that. And we're kind of just in this archaic way and it's really kind of hurting us now in this point we're seeing now with the kids and just the way we're we're not i don't know we're just not adapting right so that's a, that's refreshing to hear you say it yeah. uh as a person on the inside like that i want to ask you also then um what is maybe something i just stand with education for a second when you see the teachers and yes. the the educators themselves you know everybody says that one great teacher can have a profound effect. And I remember you said you talked about history. I was a big history buff in, in school. And it was because I had a history teacher in junior high school who mm -hmm. uh, she she set me straight. I remember that she was she was uh, African-American woman. And right. uh, I'll never forget Mrs. Thompson, if you're watching. <laughs> she she basically told me she said, listen, you're not going to just slide in this class. I'm not playing with you. You better get together, get your act together. And I did. And and that that had such a big effect right. on me. Right. What do you feel, I don't want to say, because I don't want to disparage people who are really trying to do their best, but what, right. what do these teachers maybe need more of to be able to reach these kids in a different way? Right. I think the role of teachers has taken on much more than teachers are, in most cases, are able to do. Yeah. Uh, you know, before when you were able just to just be a teacher, because there were different phases and facets of your life that were being addressed that didn't have to be addressed in school. Yeah. And so... Uh, I think that that teachers, uh, if they had more support, mm -hmm. uh, teachers also were more in control of 
their outcomes versus, mm-hmm. you know, you have to you have to meet a, a certain standard at a certain time mm-hmm. or you're a failure. OK. Yeah. You know, when you're working with 35 in some cases in, in schools in urban areas, there's 35 students per classroom. Yeah. You're, th- you're working with 35 different personalities. That's true. All you have to do is go to a family reunion <laughs> and then you say, how can I teach? If I can't even interact with my family reunion yeah. correctly, right? Yeah. So when you have 35 different personalities who have been told 35 different things leaving the house this morning, who have experienced 35 different things coming to school, mm. 35 things about how they feel about school, yeah. and now there's one person who's in charge of giving them direction and guidance and and then the person, some of those percentage of those children don't want to take any advice from that person. Yeah, that's, yeah. Right? And so I think that teachers, you know, to be fair to teachers, I think they've been given much more responsibility than they should be. And so uh, uh, I think that if teachers are just able to teach and also teach in their strengths mm-hmm. of their lanes, because, you know, sometimes we'll just take teachers. You could be a, an expert in math, but I need a social studies teacher. Right. Yeah. And so you're learning as the children are trying to learn. And so it can be frustrating for you. So I just believe that if teachers are given the opportunity to operate in their lane of strength, that they'll be more successful and the schools will be more successful. Yeah. And on the other end, the, pre- the principal needs to understand, and I know you're going to ask me this, but the principal needs to understand that the success of that school is their legacy. Mm. And most principals don't understand that. Yeah. Right. So that is that's, that's <coughs> an excellent. That's an excellent point of view there. So and then, yeah, we're going to get back to uh, legacy <laughs> in a minute. But I also want to talk to you. You are um, you run the PAW group. Correct. And. If you could just expound a little bit on what that is for okay. people who don't know. Well, uh, it's the PAW group is really the Professional Athletes Wellness Group. Mm-hmm. And so what we did is a, a former business partner of mine, a great mind young man named Jeremy uh, Parrott. And I sat down because he was actually uh, uh, a high level uh, athlete, uh, tennis and golf for the University of Georgia. He actually played on the golf team of the University of Georgia championship team. But he and I had had met and we sat down and we put together this group because what we saw and what I saw over the years was that so many athletes were being pushed forward because of their athletic ability and none of their uh, unforeseen trauma was ever being addressed. Yeah. And so that unforeseen trauma just would get pushed lower as you moved higher, but then eventually it would come out. And if it came on at the professional level, now people say, why didn't we address this earlier? Yeah. You knew about it. You never want to address it. <laughs> right. Because what you're doing is looking at this person as a cash cow. Yeah. And they, how much money they can make for me. So the Professional Athletes Wellness Group was just started to be sort of the Trojan horse to get into athletes through the auspices of athletics. Because how we started, like, and how I started my, wrote my book, uh, I did a workshop, So You Want to Be a Professional Person, about 40 people showed up. Mm -hmm. I did a workshop, So You Want to Be a Professional Athlete, about 400 people showed up. Mm -hmm. About 200 athletes and about 200 other people who were behind them, Mm -hmm. hoping that they make it because their uh, life expectancy was determined with the 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 athlete's success. So the Professional Athletes Wellness Group was set up to be the intervention prevention program that would uh, address athletic behaviors before it got to a high level or to then when it happened, how would we go in and make them see the consequences of their actions and set up some type of uh, um, sort of therapeutic way to diffuse that by getting to the root of this problem Mm -hmm. and then having people address that. So it was really set up for that purpose and then to be the focal point in communities about what this athletic journey looked like. Yeah. And so many, you know, so many people uh, believe that they're going to be professional athletes, right? Yes. but they don't understand the numbers and they don't understand the journey. So that's what the professional athlete wellness was really set up for. And we had, in the beginning, we had some wonderful uh, ambassadors uh, through all of the professional sports. And, um, you know, currently what we're doing is we're doing um, some work through some initiatives in Florida, mm-hmm. uh, through some major, uh, hopefully some major sponsors that have saw, that see the value in this and how important it is to disperse this information into communities, uh, especially those who put athletics first versus over, over academics. Yeah, that is, um, which is an, 
an excellent thing that you're doing because, uh, you know, it's funny. It reminds me, I watched, I remember one of their biggest documentaries ESPN did was uh, one called Broke. Mm-hmm. And it was about athletes talking about how easily they lose the money that they, they right. get, you know, and guys were just being very candid about it where, you know, you know, you're 20 years old and now you got $15 million. Right. You know, you, you weren't taught how to manage that. And you don't mm-hmm. know. And, and so many of them, as you talked about, said there are so many friends and family and people that yeah. the pressure of trying to support, you know, and, you know, people kind of flippantly call it an entourage. But really, you know, you got your mother and your, yeah. your cousin, all these people you came up with and, you know, the pressure of that. And these young men just weren't prepared at all. And what you're doing and others is trying to at least educate them like watch out for this watch out for that and so i was really impressed just reading that up on your site you know so i would love to ask you then you know young athlete just maybe not even in the league yet but good real good you know what is he comes to you and maybe what's the first thing that you kind of want to tell him if he just i need some help mr edwards uh you know i got an agent you know what i mean and maybe i'm getting drafted or whatever what is one of the first things or bits of advice you give that guy or uh, young woman. Yeah, I would say, you know, the main thing is what I say. It's uh, I say numbers don't lie. People do. <laughs> yeah. Right. Because no matter how good you are, uh, there's only a certain and a selected amount of individuals who get selected yeah. to go to that level. You know, in football, it starts off in high school. Over one million athletes uh, play the game. And by the time you get to the NFL, there's only 355 drafted. Mm. So every year out of college, there's 9,000 eligible individuals to play NFL. There's only 355 who get drafted. I got to say that again to people. Mm -hmm. Now you got to realize that in the NBA, there's over 2,000 players who are eligible to be drafted. There's only two rounds. So that means there's only 64, 60, yeah. 64 players who get drafted. Now what people say, well, there's an opportunity to play overseas. But you didn't you didn't come this far to play overseas. <laughs> That's right. And yeah. then they say there's the G League. And I was just at the G League showcase uh, talking to a few of the players there and talking to uh, some of the uh, higher ups about how can we possibly implement some stuff in the G League. But there's so many guys who say I'm playing professional. But is that the goal? Right. You know, yeah. the, that's like saying you're second place. Nobody remembers who won the Super Bowl last year. That's so, you know, so yeah. <laughs> so that's the first thing I tell them is, you know, uh, where are you? And it's not about who, you know, it's who knows about you, hmm. because the people who know about you are not talking about you. So if you're not being talked about, you know, that's the one thing you better not. People say you better not be talking about me. Well, in this professional <laughs> athletic stuff, you better hope people are talking about <laughs> that's you the truth. because that's the way you're going to move I know through. that's right. So that's amazing because I heard um, I heard I think it was Chris Rock and he said, you know, he told his daughter, he said, you know, baby, you can be whatever you want to be as long as they hiring. Right. <laughs> you know, because right. if they not and that's the numbers are real. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. Everybody. Look, listen, I want I'm five foot nine. Everybody <laughs> wanted to be in a, a hooper. But right. it's just so many slots. And yeah. so. You know, have something. That's why they would say get your education, have something else. But it's hard for some of these guys to see that until the reality hits them. But uh, there's so many things that I could hit with you uh, in terms of what you do. But for those then that maybe see what you're doing. Right. And now it's a different kind of arena where now I'm going to bring to you another person that comes to you and it says, mm-hmm. wow, OK, I see that you're so many hats you've worn and so many things you're helping people out with. What would you tell that person in terms of, man, I'd, I'd like to do something like you're doing, you know, uh, Rory. I'd like to be able to kind of take the knowledge I have and mm-hmm. consult or help this company out or, you know what I mean, start a little foundation and things like that. In terms of what's gotten you to where you are, how would you help that person out? Uh, again, I think um, everybody has different experiences and, and different outcomes from their journey in life. Mm-hmm. And uh, I remember, it's funny you said I had a gentleman who told me, oh, we're both um, motivational speakers. I said, that's just a title. Mm. We will never talk about the same thing. You're 30 years old. Yeah. I'm 60 years old. Yeah. So we have two different journeys. So if somebody asked us to go into a room and gave us a topic, we would come out the room with different stories. There would be some correlations and some overlays. But in reality, we would talk about Two different total things. Our outcome would be for the person to get to where they're going, the outcome. Right. But the way that we got there would be totally different. So I tell people there's a few things that um, that you need to do to be whatever that you're gifted to be. Mm. Because, see, 
like you said, I wanted to be a pro basketball player also. <laughs> I knew very early that the guys in my neighborhood were really good. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, and there was other things that I tried, but sometimes we have a gift and we push it aside because it's not popular yeah. or it's not sexy. Or, you know, the girls that we may like are not <laughs> going for the guys right, yes. that are doing that. So what we do is we try to become something that's popular for people to smile at us and people to like us and people to, to, to follow us and people to, to respond on our post instead of trying to follow what our true gift what's is. For, yeah, and so I tell people, if this is truly your gift, then what will happen is that you need to, to, to explore those people who you aspire to be like because everybody who wants to be like somebody, somebody's already done it. Yeah. So you don't have to go out and, and talk like an individual and 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 say the same words, but but like them. But take your experiences mm -hmm. and put them into something that ultimately gives people the outcome that you're standing up before them to do. And so for me, uh, the one thing is that I've always been able to do is to influence people to just make the right right choice. Mm -hmm. I said I never tell you what to do. All I do is ask the questions. And then you answer them. Mm -hmm. So when you put your blueprint uh, uh, together, you've put it together, not me. Yeah. All I'm doing is asking you the questions on how you get to where you want to go and how you get there. You know, so yeah, that's 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 excellent. That's um, you see, guys, this is this is what he do. <laughs> He's giving already making me think about some things. I was like, man, that's. But okay, so I do I do want to get now to the the topic of legacy because, like you said, you know, there's you know guys maybe doing things at a different age of you, but you right. live some life and you've actually been able to now see, you know, uh, your children. And like I said, your daughter, she put on amazing uh, summit, which was just, it really helped inspire me when I went there. I heard so many great people. And, um, just now in terms of, we talked just a minute ago, you talked about the principal in the school and that, mm -hmm. that's part of their legacy for you now to be able to look at some of the things that you've accomplished and then see it now go another generation right. in your family. What is it now that you would ins you feel that legacy is to you at this point? Before you know, when you were a younger man, you know we might, might not even been thinking about legacy. You know, you just right. try to do what you want to do. But as you can kind of look back and see the fruits of your labor, mm -hmm. what does that mean to you in terms of the legacy that you feel you're leaving? Well, I think uh, it did. Ins it was instilled in me early because uh, also in my book, um, and that book is titled So You Want to Be a Professional Athlete. I talk about my father said he couldn't give me a lot of stuff. All he gave me was his name. Mm -hmm. And so when I tell people, so when I tell my children, I may not have millions of dollars. You know, you, you may you may go to the to the. The funeral home and they may tell you you owe something and I might tell you just to leave tell you I'm gonna write the thing leave me there until he gets tired of me there and he'll put me out but the thing is is that uh, legacy to me is that I tell my children all you have at the end of the day is your name mm -hmm. and so however you operate in that it just doesn't affect you it affects your children it affects your parents, it affects your grandparents, it affects your great grandparents. Yeah. If that means anything to you, if family means anything to you, mm -hmm. you're not just stepping up when you do something to say, I've done it. I did it by myself. Right. Right. You know, what you do is you're standing on all of the all of the wisdom and knowledge that has been given to you by those people who have come before you. And what they say is most people think, oh, you're just like your parents. No, uh, children. So my children are really a reflection of my 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 parents. Yeah. And so I won't really see the fruit of my labor until my grandchildren yeah, become so. of an age where they take what they've done. Because, see, what's happening in the teachings that I've given my children, even though my children are amazing, you know, I have three in a bonus <laughs> that are actually amazing. Uh, uh, so what they're teaching their children is the teachings of what hopefully will be the instillment of what I've given them. And, and my grandchildren will then be that true reflection of my legacy versus my children being the reflection of their grandparents' Grandparent, legacy. Yeah. So that's just uh, some, some African proverbs that's, teaching. <laughs> but. Yeah, but that, that's, that's a good, that's a nice way. I've never heard it put that way. That is, that is nice. So I want to ask you, um, I don't want to hold you too long, but I do want to ask you in terms of, I ask everyone this then, mm -hmm. and... I know there's still endeavors that you're doing and things you're still working on, but what really is your vision of success 
in what you're doing where and not that you already you know, you've already had a lot of success but right. is there anything else where I'm really working toward this. I have a, a vision of maybe getting this accomplished or doing this or yeah. something else, I, a new challenge that I have. You know what I mean? Any other visions of success that you maybe see on the horizon coming for you personally? Well, I think, uh, you know, you talked about the international stuff. Um, I was supposed to be in New Zealand actually, <laughs> as we speak. Yeah. Uh, it was just a, a hiccup in the paperwork, but they said hopefully in, in the next few weeks I will be going there. Uh, we're trying to put this information on an international level because the international scene is is also now a part and a w woven in fabric of our culture. Mm. And a lot of our athletes who believe they're going somewhere will not have those positions because the athletes from uh, international countries are probably a little bit more fundamentally sound, mm -hmm. where we're PlayStation sound. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, all we want to do is shoot the three in basketball, and all we want to do is play running back or receiver or quarterback yeah. because we see people on TV playing it. It's the glamour. Versus, yeah. It's the glamour. Everything that glitters not gold, though. Mm -hmm. But so I think that the inter being that international voice uh, to also transcend back into – the communities that uh, uh, look like me mm -hmm. is probably my my ultimate definition of, of success. I don't think um, I'll ever give up this 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 journey I'm on until yeah. it's time to give up. And at that particular time, I will be um, satisfied with the success that I've given been, mm -hmm. been given because only only the Creator can give you the success that you were designed to do deliver. And see, some people try to push past, past that. And I'm content. Yeah. I'm content with the fact that if uh, tomorrow, if I'm no longer that voice, then I'm content to go sit down and relax and say, hopefully I've given it to someone else enough for them to carry the torch. Yeah. And it's just, you know, it's, it, that's how I look at success. Success is not, uh, it's not visual. It's not something that uh, people can, can can take score for yeah. and say, oh, he has five cars. He's successful. Um, you know, he has three houses. He's successful because uh, one strong tornado can take all that away. Yes, hey, that's right? the truth. That's but the truth. It's the thing that would that you put between these nine inches up here mm -hmm. that can never be taken. Yeah. And so success is that I have a sound mind is that I, I've given at the end of the day, I've given everything that I had to some other uh, people who want it and they're doing well by what our journey is because we're all on the same journey. Yeah. We all want the same outcome. We really do. That's amazing too because you, you, you said content and that that's something I think some people never really find is contentment, you know, and, and the word says godliness with contentment is great gain and we know it's funny. I was at once talking with some friends about, uh, I, I'll just say an athlete and he's, mm -hmm. he's retired and he never won a championship. And you know how it is in sports. They yeah. just judge they judge success on wins and losses. Did That's you get right. a championship or did you not? That's and so right. this this particular athlete did not get a championship. And somebody was just like, man, my man was just a failure. He never and – I, and I thought, I said, you know, I was like, no. He's, right. This was an all-star player. Right. He made his great-grandchildren a set. I was like, isn't that the point? I mean, sure, he didn't win a, a, a trophy, but right. – I feel like he is a success, and we started talking about that, and and we say, yeah, that's you know, if you just like you say, if you just want to count the numbers and just look at it from one prism, then yeah, yeah a lot of people are not going to be a success if we're just talking about lifting up a trophy. But he's done, you know, maximize his 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 potential. I right. felt he did, and he did the best that he could. So that is success. So absolutely, sitting with Mr. Rory Edwards, this has just been. Outstanding. It was as good as I knew it was going to be. <laughs> he, he brought it. This is just how he was at the summit as well. <laughs> I love to end and ask, uh, of course, you being an author and things like that, I love to ask my guests if they read anything uh, lately or just a favorite book they could share with the audience, something to recommend somebody to, aside from your own book. And we're going right. to make sure you get all your plugs in a second. But <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> anything else that you maybe read interesting lately that you can maybe pass along? Well, there's, there's two things that I do when I read. One, I try to read something new mm -hmm. that I think uh, can keep me connected and grounded mm -hmm. to the pulse of what's really going on. And so I recently just purchased uh, Made in America, the oh, story okay. of Jay-Z yeah. uh, written by... Um, Michael Eric Dyson. Yeah. And uh, it just gives you an understanding of Jay-Z's journey, but not only his journey, but just how things are uh, 
catapulted or pulled back or why this person makes it, why this person doesn't make it in mm. America. So it's a very interesting book. But one of the books that I always refer to, I refer to a lot of books, but one of the books that I think is one of the greatest books ever written, the gentleman is no longer with us, is called The Blueprint for Black Power. Mm. And it's by Amos, Amos Moses. And Amos talks about all of the things that um, gives us the opportunity to not only instill black power within ourselves, but also in our communities and how we engage in conversations and how we engage in who we associate with mm -hmm. and who we uh, disassociate with and how we can recognize people's uh, understanding of power, not through the title black power, but it's through what you are mm -hmm. and your power. And so he wrote it from a black perspective, but it's but it's a very, very, very good book. Uh, I always refer back to it. It sits right on the uh, nightstand of, of my of my bed. And just sometimes when I'm going through uh, whatever I'm going through, I'll pick it up and flip to a chapter and go and read some of that stuff that just gives you the empowering thoughts mm -hmm. that give you an opportunity to, to lay your head down to go to sleep and hope that you wake up in the morning with the enthusiasm and the energy to just move forward the next day to help those who uh, are uh, supposed to be helped by you. I need. I've never heard of that one. I need to check that out. That's a yeah. great read, sir. Please let people know where they can find you. Your your plugs, your your website, social media, anything that if they want to get more of uh, Rory Edwards, they can find you. All of my social media is my name, Rory T. Edwards. My Gmail is Rory T. Edwards one at gmail dot com. My website website is Rory T. Edwards dot com. All of my social media is Rory T. Edwards. Uh, what I said, I stand on my name. Yeah. So. That's what I uh, stand on. The title of my book, you can get it from my website if you have an aspiring athlete in your house or if you're a parent who has an athlete or if you're a coach trying to lead athletes to the next level. It's called So You Want to Be a Professional Athlete. You can get it on my uh, website, uh, www.rorytiewis.com. I also have two more books coming out. All right. uh, one is called The Power to the P. It's a 13-step synergistic blueprint to help you mind map through anything that's going on in your life. And it gives you the who, what, where, when, how, why uh, <laughs> in your life that can yeah. cause you to, to, to be derailed. And the second, the third book is called The 13 Commandments of Rory T. Edwards. And it's really about 13 steps that will give you and empower you to be the best you can possibly be going forward in your life. Awesome. Awesome. I'm telling you guys, <laughs> check, check it out. Uh, it's, a, it's an amazing, an amazing journey that he's been on and some amazing things that he's doing for people, just not locally, but like you say, he's international now as well. This is Monty Mont. This has been the Shareholders Podcast. I want to thank you guys for investing in us. Please check out the website, everything you need there. I know some of you all still struggling with the podcast concept. So all you got to do is go to the website. You can listen from there. You can watch. We got the YouTube links, all of those things as well. I do appreciate the support from all of you. And I've heard some great things, especially just from the last couple of ones. And I hope you're really being blessed by it. Thank you, sir, for being on. Oh, absolutely. Thank you for having pleasure. me. Thank all you. right. You guys keep watching and stay sharp.